Okay, well, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? I wanna welcome everybody uh, to uh, today's discussion. Uh, so my name is Seth Bloomsack. I co-direct the Center for Energy Law and Policy at Penn State. And uh, today's, today's uh, virtual panel discussion is co-sponsored by the Center for Energy Law and Policy and the John and Willie Leone Family Department of Energy and Mineral Engineering at Penn State. And so today's panel brings together an interdisciplinary group of experts from, from Penn State and from industry on energy markets, law, and policy. And, um, and, and so what we're gonna be discussing today is uh, the recent increases in oil and natural gas prices, both globally, in the US broadly, and in Pennsylvania specifically. And so as economies around the world have started to emerge from the global pandemic, prices for both oil and natural gas have reached levels that we haven't seen in years. And these price increases, again, both in the US and in other countries, are starting to raise the specter of shortages in heating fuels and electricity as we head into winter right, and also other economic consequences. And these price increases are also happening sort of against the backdrop of a new set of global commitments to transition to more sustainable energy sources. And so the kinds of questions that you know, uh, we, we've gathered these knowledgeable folks to talk about uh, include things like what is driving these price increases, both globally, right, and, and here in the US, right? What does this mean for winter heating costs in our area or, or in other areas? And, um, you know, in particular, how are these price increases, how might they be related to this uh, transition to uh, more sustainable energy sources that we are going through uh, in the US and globally? Okay. Um, so uh, as, as, I, as I had mentioned that uh, today's session is, is being co-organized with the Center for Energy Law and Policy and the John and Willie Leone Family Department of Energy and Mineral Engineering. Uh, Professor Sanjay Srinivasan is with us as head of the department and the Leone Family Professor of Energy and Mineral Engineering. And so I'm just gonna hand it over to Sanjay for a second to say just a couple of words. I just wanted to welcome everyone uh, to this very exciting session. It's on a topic that's on top of everyone's mind. I, I don't know about you, but Thanksgiving travel, um, you know, filling up our gas tank three times <laughs> during the travel did, did put a, a dent in our budget. And so uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of people will, will be watching the discussions today with a great amount of interest. Um, and uh, we have a, some of the more uh, most uh, accomplished re researchers in this, on this, in this area um, willing to share their opinion with us. So welcome to the panelists and welcome to the audience. Um, hopefully your next hour would be full of uh, very, very important information on, on this important topic. Thank you, Seth. Okay, thank you, Professor Srinivasan. Uh, so we are also joined today um, by our, our three panelists. So uh, we have uh, Dr. Dean Foreman, who is the chief economist at the American Petroleum Institute. And Dr. Foreman has uh, more than two decades of experience studying oil and gas markets globally. Uh, we have Professor Andrew Pleat, who is a professor of energy and environmental economics in the John and Willie Leone Family Department of Energy and Mineral Engineering here at Penn State. Uh, and uh, last but certainly not least, we are jo joined also by Professor Hannah Wiseman, who has a, a joint appointment with Penn State Law and Energy and Mineral Engineering. Uh, and Professor Wiseman also co-directs the Center for Energy Law and Policy with me. So um, just a note, a couple notes for uh, our audience before we get into things. So uh, the panel discussion is being recorded. Um, it will be available for viewing after the session is over. And so those who registered for the event will be notified via email when the recording is available. Um, we do invite questions from the audience. What we would ask is that if you have a question that, that you would like uh, our panelists to address, uh, please put it in the Q&A uh, in, in the Q and A box in Zoom and uh, we will uh, go through those as we as we get them right and uh, and 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 uh, ask them uh, of our panel. So um, I guess I, I would just I would just sort of like to get started. Um, 
by, by, by asking Dr. Foreman um, just to talk a little bit uh, about what exactly has happened. So can you give us a little bit of context on what is going on with oil and gas prices, right? Yes, they have risen. How high have they risen? And you know, in kind of in some historical context, how high are the prices that we are seeing? Sure. Well, Seth, first, thank you, and thanks for the center for inviting me. I'm excited to to share those perspectives with the panel. Recent prices, they're sitting at the highest really for oil since 2014 and since 2013 for most petroleum products. So in Pennsylvania, you're sitting there with with gasoline around $3.40 per gallon per AAA. And that's about um, 20 cents per gallon, I guess, um, different from the national average. So Pennsylvania prices, they're now maybe 60 cents for context, 60 cents per gallon below the record that they set in July 2008 if we adjust for price inflation. So why is it there? You know, crude oil is the top input in making gasoline and other refined products. EIA, the US Energy Information Administration, will estimate that it's about 57% of the retail price per gallon as of October. So you know, historically, the prices of gasoline, diesel, and other refined products have moved up and down along with the price of crude oil. So while crude oil prices relate now to global and US supply demand dynamics, natural gas is a little bit different. It's rem remained a distinctly regional market like you have um, you know, we experience in the United States compared to the global levels, but especially the Appalachian region growing as a natural gas producer has also had its own dynamics. Global natural gas markets right now have been in absolute disarray. So consumers in Asia and Europe are competing for scarce cargoes at prices that this last week averaged $35 per million BTU. And the reasons for this are a combination of you know, strong demand that's come back with the economy, China's natural gas demand being up some 20% year on year, critically low Russian gas inventories, coupled with on top of that underperformance performance by renewables in the power sector in the United Kingdom and continental Europe. So all of this has suddenly increased beyond expectations the global demand for natural gas at a time when the global supply and drilling has been critically low in the wake of the pandemic. So this maximizes the pool for um, natural gas coming out of the U.S. Now, when we think about the U.S. prices, if we look at Friday's spot price, it closed around $5 per million BTU. So we're concerned in the U.S., right, as consumers, that natural gas wholesale prices have basically doubled in a year. But this is still one-seventh of where the international prices are. If, if we look at EIA's world, or excuse me, um, winter fuels outlook, they would say that whether we're looking at natural gas propane or fuel oil, and that we're looking at 50, 70% increase year on year. So for consumers, it's a concern both about the level, but then the sudden change of these prices affecting affordability with price inflation also you know, in tandem with all the other things that have gone up in price this year. All right, thanks. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much, Dr. Foreman. Um, I, I wanna sort of ask another kind of context question and, and I'll direct this one at, 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 at Professor Klee. So, um, it, you know, what, one of the things that, that, that Dr. Foreman pointed out was that, you know, a, a lot of what we are seeing is being driven by an, an, an increase in demand um, for in, in Europe and Asia, right, amid, you know, scarce supplies in those regions, okay? Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it, if you look at the U.S., over the past decade, we have become the largest oil producer in the world, right? One of the largest natural gas producers in the world, and Pennsylvania in particular has become a major natural gas producing state. Um, and, and so, you know, it seems like a little bit of a puzzle, right? With, with so much domestic supply, how is it that prices can be rising here? Thanks, Seth, and thanks for inviting me. One thing you have to understand about oil markets is they're one big pool. Oil markets are connected around the world. So the price on oil on one side of the world will affect the price on the other side of the world. The United States has become close to an exporter. It's gone up and down recently. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that the prices of oil in 
the Middle East or China or Europe don't affect the price of oil in the United States. Because basically, oil can be sent anywhere by tanker fairly easily. And so what, what firms do that ship oil is they look for the highest price market. Some, some cargoes will come to the United States, some will come to Asia, some will come to Europe. But what that means is that consumers in various places are competing for the same molecules, the same source of energy. Now, natural gas markets are a little different because natural gas is so hard to transport. Um, there are now substantial export facilities in the United States where basically what you have to do is free is liquefy the gas, put it on a ship and send it somewhere else and then gasify it. And this is fairly expensive on the order of about uh, six to eight dollars per thousand megawatts, where the price of the United States, as Dean pointed out now, is about five dollars. But the key there is that um, we have limited export facilities. And so what you see right now is the price of gas in the United States is a little below five. It costs six to eight dollars to ship to Europe, but the price of in Europe and in Asia is around thirty dollars. And that's because simply because Unlike in oil, there are limits to how much gas you can send or you can export from the United States. Thanks, Professor Cleet. Um, I to um, I, I I've got sort of another overview question that I'm gonna I'd like to direct to, to Professor Wiseman, and this is something else that that Dr. Foreman had touched on a little bit. Um, so you know, even though we are not seeing the magnitude of price increases for oil and gas here, or, or at least for natural gas. You know, here as we are in Europe, uh, you know, natural gas is still uh, a, a, is still a major heating fuel, right, in Pennsylvania and the region. But it's not the only one. People heat also heat their homes with electricity and oil, right? And so, sort of overall, um, what What's your sense of how these how these rising fuel prices are likely to to impact energy costs this winter, especially in 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 our region? And you know, do you see a kind of a difference in these effects in these impacts, whether you're uh, you know whether you heat your home with natural gas or electricity or something else? Thanks, Beth. Uh Dr. Foreman referred to the Energy Information Administration's winter projections. And the reason all forms of heating costs will increase this year is in part because of the price increases and also because there's an expectation that more heating will be needed. Uh, in the EIA's projections, they, they rely in part on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's winter weather forecast, which suggests it will be a colder winter than last year. So there will be more heating volume demanded and the price per unit will be higher. And as a result of that, as Dr. Ford mentioned, especially for households that primarily heat with natural gas, so that's about 50% of households in Pennsylvania, uh, on the national average increase will be $170 for the whole season. So up to about $746. And that would be about a 30% increase in the cost of, of natural gas heating nationwide. Now in the Northeast in Pennsylvania, that natural gas increase will be about 14% increase. And this is all as compared to last winter. Uh, electricity, on the other hand, the price increase is expected to be a little lower in the Northeast, about 7.3% or half of the increase in natural gas. So the, the price increases will certainly differ depending on the primary heating fuel used in a household. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to come back for a minute to a couple of things that were, were raised by, by Dr. Foreman and, and Professor Cleet, right? Um, because, I, you know, on the, on the one hand, um, we have a truly global market, you know, we have a truly global market for oil. And, the, and so even though the U.S. is a major oil producer, then global demand is going to is is going to effectively bid prices up here in the U.S. Right, even though we even though we uh, have have a lot of our own supply, um, but the the picture seems to be a little bit different for 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 natural gas. Right, on the one hand, 
as, as Dr. Foreman pointed out, natural gas markets are you know, much more regional or kind of continental in nature, right? Um, on, the, on the other hand, uh, the, 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 the price increases that we have seen in Europe also seem to be having an effect here. Um, so uh, to what extent are natural gas markets in particular kind of becoming more globalized, right? And I guess I'll, um, I guess, I guess Dr. Foreman, do you want to take a first stab at that one? Yeah, sure. I'll be glad to. The trade of liquefied natural gas, as Andy was describing, you know, really has grown and created more connection than there's ever been among regions. So, you know, on the margin, it pulls a little bit off of the U.S. market in this sense. But as an investor, if you're going to build a $10 billion export facility to liquefy and transport natural gas, by and large, most of this has to be get its own production. And this isn't the, like in other countries where you tie the reserves to it, but by and large, you want to contract or have firm capacity commitments so that they know when they invest that it's going to come, the vast majority of the supply, the feedstock gas that's going to go into this is going to come from known areas. And this is, for example, why the Haynesville production area of East Texas and Louisiana has done so well throughout the downturn and is actually well above its drilling activity back in 2019. But if you were comparing, for example, to Pennsylvania, where most of the producers are companies that don't have much access to premium global markets, as of this last week, the drilling activity was still more than 17% below where it was at the same point in 2019. So we have a multi-speed market that's opened up because LNG can really only pull so much out of the US. And we've also expanded a pipeline system, by the way, going south from Texas into Mexico that's now exporting more than 6 billion cubic feet per day. So between 10 to 11 billion cubic feet per day of LNG, another six going south, and a bit back to Canada. You know, those are our, our gross exports sitting there. It's maybe 20% at most of the domestic production that we've got. It doesn't really, really cannibalize the markets. The reason we've seen the disconnect in supply and demand, demand has come back along with the economy. There's no question about it. But I could give you numerous examples where whether it's workforce and supply chain issues, whether it's trucking of supplies, and now energy policy, for example, federal energy policy proposing to all but eliminate natural gas in the power sector, this it cools investment, it deters investment. It's hard to make investments that are gonna last 20 or 30 years against that backdrop. Also now against the headwinds of all the things post pandemic. So there are multiple pieces to it. I guess you could take some solace in the fact that only so much gas can be offshore at this point. So this is as good as it gets, if you will, from an export standpoint until more terminals are completed. And there are some that are still under construction here. But that's not enough to connect global markets. It just creates that pull on the margin for natural gas. Okay. Um, so I, I, you're, the, the, the response brings actually brings up um, uh, a, a, another question, and this one was also asked by 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 one of one of our one of our audience participants, which is to kind of to put this um, the you know to 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 put the impacts of of U.S. gas export capability in some perspective, because this is a fairly recent, I mean, this is a fairly recent development, right? And for, yeah. you know, years and years, the, the U.S. was preparing essentially to become a major gas importer. And then in the past several years, we have effectively sort of turned that around. Um, and, and so just to give this, just to give kind of what's going on in global gas markets a, a little more context, um, either for, for you, Dr. Foreman, or, or, for, or for Dr. Klee, um, what kind of what was happening in global gas markets before the, the US became a big exporter, right? Was there just a total disconnect between the North American gas market and and the and the rest of the world, or kind of what what did that what did things look like before the U.S. became a gas exporter, right? That are different than how they look today. Well, there was Seth, if I might, yeah. there was very little imports or exports of natural gas in the United States, say ten years ago, and so the the markets were in effect disconnected. 
what you saw is patterns of exports of natural gas from Qatar, from Australia, from various OPEC countries to both East Asia, a constant, fairly constant Japanese and South Korean demand and a rising Chinese demand and over to Europe. And of course, Europe has been very dependent on, on, on imports of gas from Russia and gas has played a prominent part, natural gas has played a prominent part in the Russian economy. So I'd add to that the North American perspective. You know, we've always had uh, a robust and integrated trade with Canada for natural gas. And what's changed starting about a decade ago was the concept that we could ex we had so much gas, so much production with the energy revolution that we could export this off of shale gas to the rest of the world. And doing that off of shale gas, not stranded gas, which had you know really zero opportunity costs when we have a relatively healthy market here in the US, that, that's been really the pivotal change in the business model. As US producers have teamed through the value chain and you now have um, you know, this 10 to 11 billion cubic feet per day of, of export capacity for LNG. And by the way, that could grow and double by 2030 based on the slate of projects that could be potential investments here. If that continues to happen, this really does uh, become something that's transformative for global markets in the sense that the business model that has evolved along the US Gulf Coast in particular, pricing index to Henry Hub prices, not to international or oil, oil linked prices like the contractual arrangements that are typical in Asia and parts of Europe. On, on top of that, the, the notion that the business model could grow up with uh, the US has introduced flexibility and the destination of these cargoes. There's been a shift towards shorter term contracting. All of this made possible really by the US energy revolution, creatively changing the business model, growing the supply, all of that. Now the US business cycle that's gone with natural gas, you know, to your question about what exactly it looked like before, we have gone through the ups and downs, right? And in 2012, when prices fell out of bed um, they, and, and went low, the market for you know, the international pool was there. And then when prices have gone higher, the international pool for, the, for advancing these projects has cooled. In this environment today, we've seen the projects that are approved continue to move forward, but it's very difficult at this juncture to move the multi-billion dollar capital projects of any sort forward unless and until we get some normalization post COVID. So it, the business model has made such progress, it really is night and day from where the US was, but we need to see where it can go now post COVID and with the way the industry is evolving globally. So um, the I think the the COVID versus post COVID environment is, is an important element of this. And, um, you know, certainly, the increase in global demand has come, you know, as you know, as as world economies are kind of starting to, you know, pull themselves out of pandemic mode, so to speak. Um, on the other hand, as somebody uh, just sort of pointed out in the Q and A, right? Uh, once the sort of, you know, once news of the Omicron variant surfaced and countries started imposing travel bans, I mean that that you know that that in and of itself. Uh, seem to have triggered a small but maybe maybe possibly short-lived decline, <laughs> right? In you know in you know in uh, 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 oil prices in particular, and and so I guess you know the, the the question for for anybody who wants to offer a thought on this is um, is it, you know how it is kind of is the 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 run-up in prices that that we had seen right. Um, and any volatility up or down that may, you know, happen as the pandemic progresses, is this all the world coming out of COVID, or is there so, is there something else going on? I'd love to weigh in first, if I may. Sure, go ahead. Just, the biggest thing that's changed has been world investment and drilling activity and production on the oil side. If we, the demand side has really come back strongly with the 
economy. And if we take the EIA, the Energy Information Administration's data point last week, petroleum demand in the US was 21.8 million barrels per day. That's 3% above where it was at the same point in 2019 pre-COVID. So keep that in perspective. There's no question that economic growth and energy demand, both for oil and gas, have gone hand in hand. But on the supply side, we're still down more than a million and a half barrels per day off of our peak levels in late 2019, early 2020. As a result, we have, you know, as demand has come back and our refiners are, are meeting that demand, we've drawn inventories down below, below their five-year band or five-year range. We have shifted in 2020 from being a petroleum net exporter by a small amount to now for six of the last eight months being a petroleum net importer. And historically, this combination of demand outstripping supply, low inventories and growing import reliance, and you know, as was noted earlier, the you know, bidding prices domestically up toward import parity, that's been a recipe for upward pressure on prices. Seth, if I might, I think we're back to the so uh, what we used to think of as the old paradigm of energy economics. You've got, you've got a couple of challenges here. First of which is that investment takes a long time for a lot of energy products. And so it's slow to respond to prices. The second is that consumers are also slow to respond to prices. There are things you can do to reduce your energy costs, but you can't really do them in the long run. You could, in the short run, you can do them in the long run, you can buy more fuel efficient homes and things like that. And so what we used to see, and I think we may be going back to, is a situation of volatile energy prices. We've had fairly stable energy prices for the last five years or so. But now what I suspect is we're going to do, and I'm not sure we ever get to a post COVID world, but in a world where you have a lot more uncertainty, and I think it's gonna be a lot harder for oil and natural gas companies to invest with confidence. And so I think we're gonna see more volatile energy prices. Okay, um, so I, I want to. Um, can I just I ask a quick follow up on on one on one element of kind of what what both of you folks have have addressed? Not so much, uh, I, I guess I guess a little bit around investment, but but also in production. Um, so it certainly looks like there has been kind of a decline in investment. Um, in, you know, in the, the 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 U.S. right, and and as Dr. Foreman, as you mentioned at the beginning, kind of especially in the in you know in in Pennsylvania and the and the Appalachian gas play over the last several years, um, ha, has has output also decreased? So it, in the sense that our existing operators either kind of sh sh like you know are, are are they shutting in wells or are they kind of basically allowing wells to kind of go through their production decline without any sort of re-stimulation or anything like that? Sure. So during the downturn last year, there were some shut-ins. And earlier this year, if you were looking year on year, at the beginning of the year, um, the supply of both oil and natural gas was contracting year on year. But that's changed. You know, we, we've seen uh, the crude oil production, it's beginning to pick up. It's just well below its peak levels. And on the natural gas side, we're actually up like four and a half percent year on year at this point. So it, it's progress, it's coming back. But I want to underscore your point, Seth, on investment. We aren't just talking like investment going down. We have a record amount on the, well, let's take oil, a record amount of demand recovery over two years with the economy and a record low amount of global industry investment. As a primary data source, we, we track a lot on petroleum markets, but also investment. And with the investment as a flow and as a capital stock, we've seen the flow of it you know, in the second quarter, which was the last with complete financial reporting, it was $37 billion. It looks like the third quarter is gonna come in around 42. So up about 13% quarter on quarter, but still the fourth lowest quarter on record. And this compares with, I mean, it's almost half literally of the weakest point in the great financial crisis when we adjust for price inflation. So critically low investment at a time when it's really needed and drilling investment, you don't get the production without it. Thanks. Um, I guess, you know, re related to, to that investment environment, I, I want to sort of turn um, to, to Professor Wiseman for a second. Um, 
to, to ask a, to ask a little bit about the about the policy environment under which all this sort of stuff is happening, right? And there have been a, there have been a few allusions, you know, to to this policy environment in the past, you know, you know, you know during our discussion. Um, but you know, aside from all things COVID related, um, you know, if you look over kind of the past few administrations, not trying to you know kind of pin this on one administration or another. But you know, if you look over the past few administrations, um, are there kind of, I mean, are there sort of notable examples of, of policy measures, right, that um, might have contributed in, in some way to the situation that we're sort of experiencing right now? I agree with Dr. Foreman's earlier comment that the overall policy environment, including, including the current push to uh, make a rapid transition away from fossil fuels, including natural gas, are affecting the investment climate. There have been other policies directly addressing uh, natural gas and oil wells that that some might perceive as also impacting the investment. I'm, I'm not sure they have as much impact though. So for example, uh, limits on methane emissions from wells or uh, attempts to increase or decrease the amount of leasing on federal lands. I personally view those as somewhat marginal, marginal impact, maybe economists would disagree. Uh, our reliance on federal lands for production, uh, particularly from natural gas wells has gone down in the United States because most of the big shale reserves are not on federal lands. Uh, so in my view, these attempts to increase it or, or pause leasing, I'm not sure those, those have contributed much to the current change in prices, but the, the overall policy effort to uh, move quickly toward low and zero carbon fuels in the power sector and all sectors uh, is certainly uh, impacting investment decisions. Uh, Dr. Foreman or Professor Cleet, anything? Well, I think add? that to, to pick up on what uh, Hannah suggested, um, we are at the start of what I think will be a long and painful transition towards a much less carbon intensive energy sector. I'm not sure we'll ever get to carbon zero. And one of the impacts of this is that the prospects for, for making money for investment in fossil fuels is going to decline. And what that means is naturally there's going to be a lot, there's going to be less investment. And so as we start to do that, we're going to see some, we're going to see more volatile energy prices. And we're, all, we're also going to see higher energy prices as we transition to possibly higher cost renewable energy sources. And this is, I don't think this transition will easy, be easy. I don't think it will be fast. I think though that we're going to be in a world where it's going to be left, where we're going to need fossil fuels and where the incentives for investing in fossil fuels will be less. Seth, I would add that ESG related concerns and sustainable investing, you know, it really has changed the business model for, for many of the major investments in the energy sector over the last bit here. And over the last six years, if we're going back, you know, in comparing the performance across the sector in terms of its profitability, the natural gas and oil industry, if you're looking at the S&P 500 energy sector, was among the worst over all sectors for the last six years. So we can't confound though what is demonstrably a changing investment environment from an investment bank or banking standpoint with just the straight up investor choice of do you invest for, for performance. With this import reliance, we are seeing, we have seen higher prices. And the question is, you know, time will tell how the investment environment and whether investment banks, credit lines, all of that starts to open back up. I'm of the belief that there's cost uncertainty, there's economic uncertainty. We have all of the reasons that we talked about from workforce, supply chain, financial policy reasons that have, that have compounded the complexity and the risk tolerance in making those investment decisions. But despite that, if we look at the average break-even prices, the market price you need to at least break even in drilling a new well for every oil and natural gas producing basin across 
the U.S. on average right now, current market prices should be more than compensatory to be drilling. Yet we aren't seeing that drilling activity pick up at nearly the historical extent. And by the way, this is important from a policy perspective because it's why the official forecasts have not been alarmist. They have assumed in the EIA's forecast, the IEA, the International Energy Agency's forecast as well, they've assumed a healthy drilling response for oil and gas that's consistent with the way the market has historically responded to these kinds of price levels. And as Andy was saying, you know, it just, it takes time, it's not there. And at this point, we see a tick up in consecutive weeks in the oil drilling activity. It looks like it is responding. It's just well behind where demand is. And on the natural gas side, it has absolutely flatlined. We are below where we were in parts of July and August at this point. So that's a curiosity and we need to see how it plays out. So um, the, the question or the issue about um, how uh, about the role of kind of the broader transition to more sustainable energy, kind of the role that, that this plays in what we are seeing now and what we may see in the future. I, I wanna come back to this in just a minute, but while we're sort of on the, on the policy end of the discussion spectrum, um, I, I wanted to ask about a couple things in particular. One is, one is sort of a recent thing in the news and the other is something that um, was, was raised in the Q&A. Um, so, the, the first one I'll, I'll sort of ask about is that um, there is, is that, you know, the, the kind of the price levels and the price volatility that we're seeing. I, I mean, I think as, as kind of you all have sort of alluded to is the result of, in some sense, a classic supply demand imbalance, right? Um, and, you know, and capacity constraints in, different parts of the kind of the global fuels supply chain, right? We're not the only, you know, I guess we're not the only ones having supply chain problems these days. Um, but to, to what extent, you know, is there, is there uh, sort of any, any evidence or any hint of a suggestion that um, kind of what we're seeing is the, the result of you know, some either some kind of manipulative activity by suppliers, right, who may recognize that, you know, they're in a situation where supply is short, demand is high, right, and they have some influence, right, or um, by, uh, you know, by what I'll just, I'll just sort of bluntly call panic buyers, right, who are, who, you know, who are, who are in the global market and all of a sudden, you know, are kind of finding themselves short. I mean, to what extent are kind of those you know those sorts of things on kind of either end of the kind of either end of the market dynamic spectrum contributing to kind of what we've seen over the last few months. Seth, if I might, whenever there is a price burst in energy markets, almost always, almost always, the political authorities ask for an investigation of market manipulation or the exercise of market power by the antitrust authorities. And this has been going on, well, I can remember over 30 years ago when I worked at the Federal Trade Commission that we would joke about this. So this has been going on probably about 50 years. And so what? And so a couple of weeks ago, the Biden administration asked the Federal Trade Commission to investigate uh, the exercise of market power in uh, oil markets because as they put it, greed had broken out. Of course, oil companies are greedy and they always are, but this isn't why prices go up. And so what's interesting happened, the Biden White House announced that there was substantial evidence of the exercise of market power and asked the FTC to respond, in which case the two Republican commissioners on the Federal Trade Commission sent out a, a letter to the Biden administration saying, well, you say you have evidence of this, but we don't, we don't know anything about that. And what you have to to understand is this is just in the words of the movie Casablanca, round up the usual suspects. And this will be assigned to some group of staff attorneys and economists at the Federal Trade Commission, who three or six months from now will issue a report saying that there was no impact. And this is just there was no, no evidence of the exercise of market power. And this is just the typical political game that happens whenever there's an increase in energy prices. Seth, if I may add, mm -hmm. I, no, I, I think that's a, it, 
it's definitely a political response that comes with a higher price environment. I think that's somewhat par for the course. What's unusual is, you know, there are things that people reasonably can disagree about, but basic math usually isn't one of them. And here, if we take the EIA's actual data and the letter to Chairman Khan at the FTC that the Biden administration has put out was comparing a price ratio of retail gasoline prices to the unfinished gasoline prices that refiners sell at. You can look at for yourself and the audience can at the AI's data, it's right out there and compare the ratios of that, or you can even go all the way through the value chain to the price that EIA reports at which refiners have acquired crude oil and look at that segment as well as part of the value chain. The ratios of retail to various wholesale markers there, they're, they're below their historical averages. They're actually lower than they were last year. Have no idea what basis on which they can make the allegation other than pure politics and saying, nope, I, I want to be able to blame OPEC. I went and asked OPEC first if they'd increase production. They've twice rebuffed the administration on this. They've asked for an investigation to see if there's any you know, um, price fixing or otherwise on the retail gasoline side. It's one of the very most competitive markets. We have basic su supply demand fundamentals that really explain what's happened with gasoline prices. By contrast, the areas that they really should be concerned about when they're coming out and saying, nope, I expect price inflation will ease over the next 12 months, the latter half of 2022. There are a lot of other industries that in between wages going up that tend to be sticky, real estate prices that are up that tend to be sticky. Um, and the examples that, for example, um, Janet Yellen has offered as to why automotive and semiconductor chip prices might come down over the next year. This is an example of just misunderstanding, again, the industry structure and the pricing power that those segments now have. You know, I'll, I'll digress for a second, but let's take some of conductor chips. For years, that industry had begged the automotive industry to switch to a new, newer generation of chips, and they didn't. Much of that capacity was decommissioned during the downturn of COVID last year. So now, if you want those chips, they're in short supply. And it's like trying to find an incandescent light bulb at this point. You can't, you, unless you pay somebody to go rebuild a factory in China to make this, it's not likely to happen. There are new chip factories being opened in Arizona and other places, you know, domestically, but it'll be a newer generation of chips and you're not there. In the meantime, we have the highest automotive prices that we've had in history. These aren't likely uh, as if we're talking about the energy transition and autos are switching more of their capital focus and manufacturing focus into electric vehicles. That means shorter supply of internal combustion engine cars and vehicles, which means stronger pricing, other things being equal. So pricing power in a couple of segments that are important, systemically important, pricing power like they haven't had in a long time. The idea that within 12 months, this will magically dissipate, I think is you know, over, oversimplifying it. In the meantime, I, I think the energy sector actually will respond, but it's just going to take time to get there. And we've continually overestimated the speed with which the market will respond in terms of normalizing and bringing prices. And now with this last week's revelation about yet another variant, we'll see where that goes. But it's going to make it harder. And it's going to continue a trend that we've had toward deglobalization or re-domiciling supply chains here. So the, um, the, the, the other thing that I wanted to ask about, and I'll, I'll see if I can get some short responses here because I don't want to get sucked into a rabbit hole on this one, um, is um, kind of the move of the, the Biden administration last week to release 50 million barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And I have two questions about this. The first is um, how, the, so the, the, the first is how unusual and, and effective a move is, is this likely to be? Um, and the second, which I guess is really kind of a, kind of a corollary to the first is, um, is, is, is there going, I mean, is, is there, does, does this move effectively have any impact on, on winter heating costs, right? And so I guess I'll, for, the, for, the, for the first part of the, for the first part of the question, I guess, how unusual is this, um, you know, Professor Cleet or Dr. Foreman, do you have any, any perspective on this? Well, this, this has happened before. Um, strangely, there's no official policy or even 
outlines of a policy on when to use strategic petroleum reserve. We do buy oil and the price of oil is high now. So when the price of oil is high, we might as well sell it. But as to the global impacts of this, I think that they're going to be relatively limited. The comparison I gave you earlier, consumption last week of 21.8 million barrels per day, a release of 50 million barrels. So you, you can do the math, it, it, it's short-lived. It is unprecedented to have it be coordinated on a global basis like it was. I, I understand, again, the, the politics and the effort here coming into the peak winter period. They're, they're trying to make things more affordable and they're trying to be seen as doing something. It's just not likely to, to be the policy that will actually affect an increase in domestic production that will actually keep downward pressure on prices. Or be likely um to. Yeah, so for, for the second part of my question, I, I sort of want to, I want to turn back to Professor Wiseman. So um, is there, uh, so, you, you know, so, so 50 million barrels in the grand scheme of things, not a, not a huge amount of oil. Um, and so, you know, maybe it won't do a whole lot as far as winter heating costs go. Um, at, at this point, right, where we're sort of almost in December, um, is there is there anything that can be done in the in the immediate term? And then, you know, if you think a little bit beyond the next you know month or or two months or so, um, does you know it, if there's a kind of a, a really difficult heating season economically, uh, doesn't I mean does does this make investments in things like like energy efficiency like much more much more attractive and is there a and is there a potential response there right to you know even if not for this coming winter to reduce demand for for winters in the future it seems in the short term there's unfortunately very little to be done to affect the price but there can be support and there is support for those who are having trouble paying that price for this very essential, a life essential item of heating as a service. And that is primarily in the low income home energy assistance program. I think that uh, individuals, there, there may be individuals who are not aware of this, particularly if heating prices were not as high in the past, uh, those individuals may not be aware that they qualify. Uh, and so it, it's potentially just getting the word out to individuals that there is support there in every state uh, for those who have trouble paying their fuel bills. In the longer term, I think that the recent federal, uh, the federal infrastructure bill that has passed as well as the potential Build Back Better additions, uh, there is a lot of money in there for enhancing energy efficiency programs that are already quite strong in some states. Uh, and particularly the weatherization assistance program, which is federally funded, but primarily administered by state and local governments, uh, which helps again, primarily low income individuals and those who are elderly and with disabilities, helps them reduce heating and cooling costs uh, by essentially re reducing the amount of air flowing into and out of their homes, uh, as well as improving the appliances used for heating and cooling. Weatherization assistance program funds can be used to install more efficient uh, heating and cooling systems or to repair existing ones that are, are not working well. Uh, and so some of the recent money coming from the bipartisan infrastructure deal that was signed by President Biden on uh, November 15th will increase weatherization assistance program funding. And I would add that this is particularly important uh, to be focusing these funds on low income individuals because they have the highest energy burden. Uh, these heating bills are hitting them the hardest. The energy burden is the percentage of your income uh, that goes to energy costs on a monthly or yearly basis. And low income individuals, particularly those who are elderly and with disabilities have the highest energy burden up to 13% of uh, of pre-tax income going to energy costs. So any programs that can help those individuals deal with these prices, which are difficult to change in the short term are quite important. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
All right, so I want to come back to the issue about about renewables because I don't want to lose that before our 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 hour is up. Um, so I, I mean the the sort of the the big question that well the, I think there's two big questions that are connected, right? One is you know what do these higher oil and gas prices what do they mean for for renewable energy, right? And uh, the 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 second and connected one is what do they mean for the transition to renewable energy? And, and Dr. Cleet alluded to this a, a, a few minutes ago, right? When, when he suggested that, you know, as we go through this technology transition, right? Which, you know, is sort of is well on its way in electric power and may come to us soon in, you know, the, in, through other, other energy uses and uh, other fuels that, you know, we, we may well be in for this sort of period of, of uh, volatility in traditional fuels markets. Um, so, but on the other hand, if the costs of, you know, if, if the costs of kind of conventional legacy fuels get higher, that also provides a stronger economic signal to replace them with something else, right? There's, it creates more economic opportunities for, 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 for renewables. Um, and so um, I, I guess how, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll direct this in particular to professors uh, Wiseman and, and Cleet. So what, what do these price spikes mean for renewable energy, right? It, you know, do these look like they're likely to be major drivers of, of renewable investment in electricity, in, you know, electric vehicles in alternative fuels, you know, any, anything. So, uh, so do you want to start Professor Wiseman and then we'll move to Professor Cleet. Sure. So it's, it's complex because of course, uh, the big utilities that still operate in many of the states that uh, fully regulate the electricity sector, their decision-making process is very long-term. And the reason so many utilities recently invested in natural gas, they're therefore substantially reducing reliance on coal-fired power, uh, was the lower volatility of natural gas prices due to shale gas development. It was really the volatility and, and the, the lessened volatility that I think moved those utilities decision-making processes and said, okay, we're, we're going to invest heavily in this, right? Now we have this volatility, uh, but there are other, and will that move them toward a less volatile uh, uh, generation source? Perhaps. Uh, but renewables themselves pose volatility issues from a different perspective, especially with respect to reliability, right? So Dr. Foreman uh, discussed the, the downturn in renewables in Europe. So the wind in the North Sea suddenly stopped blowing. You have that issue, right? So I think utilities are balancing many factors, as well as the uh, environmental and social governance factors in these investment decisions. And, and perhaps it will push them more toward renewables, but uh, it's, it's quite complex. Maybe maybe more natural gas storage. I don't know. I'm not quite sure what that process, look, that decision-making process looks like right now. But I think, I, I think you know, that your sort of, your, I mean, your, your, your comment about gas storage actually raises sort of a, like a, like a, a, a related interesting question, which is that, you know, high gas prices, just to, you know, pick on gas for a second, right? So high gas prices, you know, we often think about those creating opportunities for renewables, right? As new market entrants, um, does it, you know, does it also create opportunities for, for coal, right? Um, you know, or right. for gas so storage or for, for other things that are, Kind of you know existing yeah, high natural gas prices should offer opportunity for substitutes in particular i don't see coal coming back because of regulatory issues but um it, it makes other forms of electricity wind power and solar power more economical i think the difficult question is trying to get the signal here from the noise is how much of this price spurt is is long term and how much is short run if you're going to invest in a wind generator for a period of 20 to 25 years, and you're not really interested in the price today, you're interested in the price of electricity a year from now or five years from now. And that makes the question, as Hannah refer, 
referred to extremely complicated. But also the thing that we haven't discussed is the fact of reliability and what happens if it's a cold winter and there's literally not enough gas to run the natural, the electricity system. And I think the economic and political consequences of that happening are very severe. So I, I guess just on that, I mean, it, kind of the events in Texas last February were sort of very well publicized and there were all sorts of economic, you know, economic and political repercussions for that. I, in, I mean, thinking about our situation here in, you know, Pennsylvania and the mid-Atlantic Northeast, um, what, what's your sense of, the, of the, the, the likelihood of kind of, you know, genuine fuel shortages or reliability issues this this winter, right? That that might be relate that might be somehow related to high prices, or um, you know, or or even even potential scarcity of supply. Well, I think you know the difficulty is how cold will it be, and the and the long run forecasts have called for fairly mild winter, but long run forecasts are not very accurate. And so what we are is in a position where we have a reduced natural gas capacity and we don't know how cold it's going to be. And that's a little bit scary. Other, other thoughts on that one? I'd underscore that we have a pretty resilient natural gas system. And well, the February Oklahoma, Texas winter event was shocking and it, it we need to keep in perspective that we also had a record amount of deliverability of natural gas during that week. So its supply did step up, came out of storage, it did find a way to meet most of the consumer's needs, and the grid made it through despite all of that. Now, I, I would anticipate, especially mid-continent, Pennsylvania, very well supplied with natural gas, no questions there. The questions are the places that are typically pipeline constrained, whether you're looking at California, whether you're looking at New York and New England, and perhaps Texas again. We'll, we'll see, despite having, you know, it will, it, maybe it's a hundred year storm, we'll see. But the changes that need to be made uh, in the system haven't completely made it, made it through the system just a few months later. So we need to see how that system adapts and what kind of winter we get. All right. Uh, so we have about um, one minute left, and I want to just uh, throw one question at at each of you for a very quick response before we wrap up. Okay, and so uh, the question is: uh, Are the 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 kind of prices and price volatility that we're seeing in oil and gas markets right now, and have seen for the past few months, um, is this something that that you think is likely to continue? Right or is likely to kind of peter out after the winter, and what are the what are the big drivers of whether this is a a blip or a feature of, of oil and gas markets moving forward? So we'll start with Dr. Cleet. Well, I'm beginning to suspect it's more of a feature that we're going to go back to a time where of uh, of strong demand and uncertain investment climates. Because of the because of the desire to move towards an energy transition, and unfortunately, I think that means that we will have more more episodes like this. Thank you, uh, Professor Wiseman. I tend to agree, although I'm fearful of making any economic projections as, <laughs> as, a, as a, an attorney. Uh, but yes, just from the perspective, we we define natural gas as a bridge fuel, a bridge to lower carbon energy. But the question is. How short or long is the bridge and when do we get off it? And I think it's gonna be quite complex in the meantime. And Dr. Foreman will end with you. Word. API doesn't make or publish its own price forecast for antitrust reasons, but in terms of the fundamentals, I think that we can say that we've learned resoundingly clearly that having domestic production provides a cushion for markets and it's historically provided downward pressure on prices whether the policies send us and market incentives send us in that direction will determine much of the volatility patterns that you're talking about. All right, thank you all. Thank you all. So um, we have, we've come to the end of our hour. So I wanna thank our three panelists very much for taking the time and for a very interesting discussion. We could easily go for another hour. Uh, I wanna thank Professor Srinivasan for 
uh, Kurt for, so for partnering with the Center for Energy Law and Policy to put this on. Um, and thanks to all of our, our participants and attendees. And uh, thank you for your questions. We couldn't get through all of, we, we just couldn't get through all of them. Um, but, and just a reminder uh, before we sign off that, um, the, that, that this event was recorded and those who registered will get a link to be able to watch it later. So uh, with that, uh, thank you everybody and stay warm.